Thanks, everybody. We will start in about five minutes. Thank you, everyone, uh, for coming. Um, the Social Security is extremely efficiently administered. Less than a penny, well less than a penny, about seven-tenths of a penny of every dollar spent um, on Social Security is spent on administration. More than 99 cents of every dollar goes out in benefits. That's an incredibly um, efficient percentage. And as you all know, it doesn't add a penny to the deficit. According to the last Social Security trustees report, Social Security has a, an accumulated surplus of $2.8 trillion. I realized I started without introducing myself. I'm Nancy Altman, uh, president of Social Security Works, part of one of the organizations that helped um, get our petitions that we'll be talking about this morning. We will have the members, they've got a very busy schedule, so they will be coming in um, when they can, and we have some distinguished speakers that you'll be hearing from. But let me make, again, these introductory remarks. That number one, Social Security is extremely efficient, and it doesn't add a penny to the deficit. Just in 2016 alone, it ran a $35.2 billion surplus. That's on top of the $2.8 trillion surplus 
that it has. That surplus and that dedicated revenue, the contributions that workers pay matched by their employers, pays in addition to paying every penny of benefits, it pays for the field offices, it pays for the personnel, it pays for the hotline, it pays for all the personnel and services that are used to administer Social Security. Again, it doesn't add a penny to the deficit. Congress does not appropriate any money for Social Security, not a penny. What it does is it limits how much can be spent on administration. And it's been starving the Social Security Administration. It's a death by a thousand cuts. And they're about to plunge the knife in again. They are planning to vote this week on a, on a budget resolution to keep the government funded. The Senate Appropriations Committee wants to cut an additional $492 million from Social Security. Its fixed costs for heating and rent and so forth is about $500 million a year. So they're talking about taking another billion dollars on top of the cuts we've seen out of the, the um, administering of Social Security. They are starving this, organi this, this um, agency. And what they are doing is they are inconveniencing all of us. They are causing long lines. They're causing long wait times. We've already paid for this. We have a surplus. But instead of letting us pay, letting us open field offices as more and more people are retiring, they're causing field offices to close and the, um, um, and the hours of those that are still remaining to be reduced. And this is not just inconvenience, as bad as that is, having to spend you, you know, your morning or your day talking, trying to get your questions answered or get a new Social Security card or apply for benefits. It actually is a matter of life or death. Because of the long now wait in disability determinations, the Washington Post show, reported that more than 18,000 people um, have in the last, just the last two years died before they could get a final determination. People lose their homes and become harmless, and become homeless. So that is why more than a quarter of a million people have signed this petition demanding that Congress stop choking this agency and let it spend the money we have all contributed. It's been collected, um, it was a joint effort by the, a number of groups that you see um, mentioned on this, um, on these boxes. We, we got the signatures in record time because people understand that they've paid for these benefits and they want Congress to do its job and let the Social Security Administration free to spend the money that it needs to spend. Later this morning, we will deliver the more than 250,000 signatures to um, Leader McConnell to insist that when they fund the, the government, they fund fully the Social Security Administration. But before that, we are gonna have some opening remarks. We're gonna start with Julian Blair, who's a veteran from Maryland, a grassroots leader. He has been working tirelessly to highlight how critical Social Security is to him and to millions of other hardworking Americans just like him and just like all of you in this room. So with that, let me turn it over to Julian. Good morning. Like I said, my name is Julian Blair and I uh, volunteer with an organization called Spaces, but I'm also a uh, member of many veteran groups and senior groups and we have seen the devastating effect of underfunding the Social Security Administration. We say that there are long lines, and there are long lines, and we visualize, but those are real people, and I can give you real stories. I accomplished a 92-year-old neighbor to the Social Security, because he's not, so he's not computer literate. We don't want to give out his personal information, so I'm going with him. We had to go three times before he could get the service he needed because the lines were so long and he's disabled. He can't stand there all day, there was no seats for him. You go in, it's four people working, 16 stations, eight people at stations, the other eight stations are closed. Real people that this affect. Uh, 
try to call. They ever try to call, call Social Security? It's not anyone's fault who's working there. It's just busy. The lines are busy all day long. You waste your whole day trying to get a phone call through. It's very real. It's not just, yeah, there are wait times, but it affects real people. And that's my point in this whole thing. Look at not just the numbers and the rhetoric we talk about all, but it's real people. They're affecting all of us. There's delays in survivor and uh, disability uh, service. I got personal stories for both of them. My uh, grandson's father passed. My daughter almost gave up in crying because she just could not get the service in a timely manner she needed for his survivor benefits. That's a shame. That should not happen. I have a brother that worked 34 years and became disabled. I read somewhere to take 697 days to get a uh, claim process. It took him two and a half years. What happens in that two and a half years? Savings gone, this, uh, unemployment gone. So real people, this affects real people. That's why I'm here, and that's what I do on a daily basis. But it's just more than the services. To us, it's a continued effort to dismantle Social Security. You know, we just see it every day. Every service gets worse. Uh, benefits are dis in discussion all the time for elimination of cuts. Okay? But today, we're going to deliver 250 signals. But it's more than these 250. There are millions of people who agree with the people who have signed in. And matter of fact, I've talked to several of them once I got the call to ask me if I could speak. They said, well, I didn't know about the petition. I wish I could have signed. I wish I could be there. But everybody, people who need these benefits, can't come out every day like we can, stand up and talk for themselves. So what we are saying now is stop this. Not only do we want to see the $492 million put back in the budget for this year, but we want to see Social Security fully funded so people who have earned benefits or who need benefits can receive them in a timely and dignified manner. Thank you. Julian, so well put. We should be opening field offices, not closing them. Exactly. Our next speaker, Dana Duggins, is Executive Vice President of the Social Security Administration Council of American Federation of Government Employees. She started working at the Social Security Administration at age 20 and has learned firsthand about the importance of Social Security and the importance and the, the desire of the employees to give as much service as they possibly can, even when the Republican Congress is keeping their resources from them. So, Dana? Thank you. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Nancy, and Social Security Works, and I know Senator Sanders is not here, but I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about our concerns and um, the voice you just heard, we hear every day. We hear people, I can tell stories for the next several hours if I had the opportunity that would bring tears to your eyes. Like most agencies, uh, Social Security um, is just one of many agencies getting cut but for the reasons that we've talked about, there's no reason for that. Um, there's an absolutely no reason with the trust fund the way it is for this agency to go without the resources it needs to help the public, the beneficiaries, the disabled, and process their workloads timely, quickly, and provide that world-class service that we were once touted as the best agency in federal government just 20 years ago. Um, the lack of staff as a result of sequestration resulted in over 4,000 jobs lost at Social Security. And this is what's headed to where we are now this last 10 years. Um, we now have lost offices, over 100 offices, over 600 contact stations. We have a backlog of over 1.2 million hearing effectuation cases, which is where that 600 number comes from, but truly from beginning to end, it's three years on average, three years. 
if you have to wait three years, as the gentleman just said, people don't have the resources to live paycheck to paycheck is all what we're living on now. To expect them to have no resources for three years is just shameful. Um, they lose everything. Most of these families lose each other. Their lives become shattered, and oftentimes many of them die before they ever see a check. The loss of, of uh, funding has resulted in extremely long wait times on our 800 number, extremely long waits in our field offices. And now, you know, the idea is instead of going to uh, fund properly, throw it into the internet. Don't give face-to-face -face service. Let's throw them to the internet and do it yourself. And that's literally what we tell people, do it yourself. Even though we know more than 90% of the people who go to the internet to file a claim disadvantage themselves benefits. That's shameful. We, as an organization, have been tracking the numbers on this for over 10 years. But now we have the Senate appropriation cuts of $492 million from current spending levels. Last year's spending level was already a cut, so now you're going to cut 492, but that's the only what you see in the bill. What they don't tell you is that over 400 million more will come off the top just for increases, cost of living, in leases, in building costs, in employer contracts, because we have a lot of contractors and employees' colas. So you're looking at almost a billion dollar cut in this year's budget. And with a billion dollar cut, it's going to do irreparable harm to Social Security. It will cause attrition to go out the door because people are going to say, I can't handle the workload, and we're not going to be able to replace one of those employees. It is going to cause us to lose our overtime, which right now is the only way that we are able to do the high profile cases. We're going to see furloughs for employees of a minimum of 20 days. Um, and, and the wait times and the, and the office hours are, are going to change for the negative. It's going to get worse and worse and worse. This is not fair to Social Security workers, but more so it's not fair. It's a broken promise to the public that we serve that has spent their viable years working and investing in Social Security. Congress created this unnecessarily hardship because the Social Security Administration and the Social Security Act says that they have the authorization to fully fund our programs and the administration of the programs. But there was a glitch in some legislation back in the 90s that has kept it in the appropriation process. And we know that would require a change of legislation. And we believe to fully fund Social Security, a legislative change is needed. And we believe the time is now to take the politics out of Social Security. I am delighted to introduce a true champion for expanding Social Security, for Medicare for all, for fighting to make sure that Social Security is fully funded and really to protect our freedom, Senator Bernie Sanders. Let me uh, begin by thanking Nancy and uh, Dana Duggins with AFGE and Max Richmond with the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare and Robert Roach with the Alliance for Retired Americans uh, for organizing this event for all of you for being here. Um, let me back this up just a little bit to put this into a context. And the context is that about 40 years ago, uh, people like the Koch brothers, who are the second wealthiest family in America, introduced an ideology into American politics, which way back then seemed pretty crazy, but has grown in its support within the Republican Party over the years. And this was their ideology. Their ideology was that the federal government should not be involved in retirement security, i.e., Social Security, public health, i.e. Medicare, Medicaid community, health centers, 
should not be involved in a postal system, should not be involved in the Veterans Administration. They, 40 years ago, were not calling for cuts in these programs. They were calling for the elimination of these programs, that maybe the federal government would fund defense. But that's about it. Corporate world would fund everything else. And over the last 40 years, we have seen that right-wing extremist ideology become the dominant ideology of the Republican Party. That is what Paul Ryan talks about every single day. So these guys ultimately want to destroy Social Security. And you can do it in a variety of ways. You can cut COLAs. You can raise the retirement age. You can cut benefits. You can cut disability programs. And you can make it impossible to administer the program by cutting the Social Security Administration. And when I meet with my caseworkers in Vermont, what they tell me is one of their frustrations is people call in and say, I have a claim that's being processed. When is it going to be processed? How long does it take? There was a piece you may have seen in the Washington Post a couple of months ago. And what it said, unbelievably, is that last year, some 10,000 people died, D-I-E-D, who were, who were with this, had disabilities, who were waiting for their claims to be processed. Can you imagine? You have a disability, you submit a claim, and you wait, and you wait, and you wait, and then you die. And now we have Republicans who want to make a very bad situation, an underfunded and understaffed Social Security Administration even worse. So let us be clear, this is not just cost saving. This is an effort to destroy Social Security. Are you going to have confidence in a Social Security Administration if they can't respond to your needs? You're going to call up, you're going to wait forever, you're going to say, who needs it? These people can't do their work, and people don't know that the Social Security Administration is understaffed and underfunded. So what is our job? And I want you all to know this. We are very conscious, Bob Casey, Elizabeth Warren, I, many others. When we look right now at this budget situation, the dire circumstance we're in right now, today, literally today, we have an alternative program to what the Republicans are proposing. Republicans want to spend a huge amount of money on the military. And what we are saying is for every nickel you spend on the military, we're going to spend on the needs of the American people. We're going to protect the American people. And very high on that agenda is not only talking about cuts to the Social Security Administration, we're talking about significantly increasing funding to the Social Security Administration so they can start hiring the people they need so that we can move these claims along at a proper role. And it's not just the Social Security Administration. You know, we talk, and I know the people behind me do a great job. In this country today, one of the shames about what's going on in America is while the very rich become much richer, we have millions of people trying to survive on twelve, thirteen, fourteen thousand dollars $14,000 a year Social Security. That cannot be done. So we've got to start paying attention to the needs of senior citizens, people with disabilities. That's what a humane moral society does. And we cannot do that unless we have government agencies able to implement the programs that exist. And we have got to make sure that they are adequately funded. So I just want to thank all of you for your work. I know that these are hard times. But please keep up the good work you're doing. Don't get discouraged. A better day is coming. That I promise you. And let's stand together in this and let's make sure that the elderly and the disabled uh, get the type of care uh, that they are entitled to as Americans. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Senator Sanders. Another round of applause, as easily. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Robert Roach, Jr. He is the, uh, the president of the Alliance for Retired Americans. He spent his entire career in the labor movement, and now represents the Alliance's more than 4.3 million members. Robert. 
Thank you, Nancy. And um, we take the opportunity to thank Senator Sanders on his way out for all his help in, in, in this particular issue and other issues. Um, let me say that as a, uh, the president of the Alliance for Tired Americans, we, we hear these problems, we listen to these issues, and we work very hard with AFGE um, to try to rectify these problems. But I am also a senior and a recipient, and I have personally felt the scourge of lack of people working in these offices, the hours are being cut. When you have problems, you go, you call up and they tell you to send this form in and somebody will call you, you don't hear from anybody. It's very difficult. And all the time this is going on, whatever your problem is, the less money that you're receiving continues to be cut. And maybe down the line, maybe down the line it gets fixed. And I also want to thank the people who are doing this work because you can see when you finally get to see somebody, they're very frustrated because they want to do the job, they're concerned, and they're concerned people. So we're supporting those people. We're supporting all the Social Security recipients and disability people who are trying to just, just go through the day-to-day -day activities. People, because of the attacks on pension plans and Social Security, have to make a different, have to make a decision between food and medicine every day. This is unconscionable in a country that is the richest country in the world. So it is necessary that we properly fund and properly staff the Social Security offices so the work can get done so that the good people that are working there, the good people that are working there who want to do the job can do the job. It is the right thing to do. We are paid for this and we expect the money to be paid on services for ourselves. Now that may not go over well, they may not understand that, in some of the Republican places and because they talk about the growing economy and we're going to make all this money and the rich are going to get richer. Well, let me just make one point to something that they might understand. You cannot grow the economy if 50 or 60 million people in this economy are being disadvantaged. The people who receive Social Security, who depend on that money, who go out and spend money in this economy. So if you don't have the moral fortitude, if they don't have the moral fortitude to do what's right, then think about the economy that you keep boasting about will die without those people receiving the benefits that they're entitled to and that they work for and that they are paid for. Again, I thank uh, Social Security Works and all the people who participate, and I thank all the people who are trying to do the job at Social, at Social Security administering the people for people like myself. Thank you very much. So thank you so much, Robert. Our next speaker, Susan Prokop, is the Senior Associate Advocacy Director of the Paralyzed Veterans of America. She has worked for over 30 years um, working on issues affecting seniors, veterans, and people with disabilities. So let me um, next turn the podium over to Susan. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you. I, I want to thank Social Security Works for holding this forum and uh, the senators for highlighting the devastating impact of these proposed cuts in Social Security's administrative budget. Um, PVA is the nation's only congressionally chartered veteran service organization solely dedicated to representing veterans with spinal cord injury or disease. and. Uh, for that reason, we, we try to educate the public and uh, the American people to the fact that uh, Social Security serves millions of veterans, whether that is through the retirement system or through the disability and survivor programs that protect them and their families. Like their fellow Americans, these veterans need a responsive Social Security when they have questions about their benefits or when they uh, go to apply for, for help. PVA has already encountered numerous instances in which wounded warriors were hampered in their, in, in their ability to take advantage of SSA's expedited processing of SSDI claims 
and we just feel that further cuts in Social Security will only deepen the problems that these veterans and other Americans with disabilities encounter. And so we thank the senators and Social Security Works again for drawing attention to this. Thank you so much. And I, I should have mentioned at the opening that after um, the speakers uh, are done, we will have question and answer and some discussion as well. And I think another senator may be about to come, so let's wait for just a minute. A little suspense here. <laughs> Who's coming? <laughs> hey! So, so it is my great pleasure that your timing is always perfect. It is my great pleasure to introduce a woman who fights for all of us who's been fighting hard her whole career and is fighting to expand Social Security and expand Medicare, Senator Elizabeth Warren. Oh, thank, you. thank you. Oh, what a day, right? Uh, but it is a good day when you are here and you are here to fight for what we believe in. You know, thank you, Nancy. Uh, thank you all. I'm so glad to be here with everyone. For millions of Americans, Social Security is a lifeline. Nearly two-thirds of all seniors depend on it for most of their income. It keeps 15 million people out of poverty. And for millions of people who suffer accidents, who get sick, Social Security disability insurance is there when they need it. We must protect Social Security. And that's why we're all here, is to protect Social Security. The fight in front of us today is about the GOP's proposed cuts to the Social Security Administration's budgets. You know, as others have said, budget cuts have forced the SSA to significantly cut back on services to close offices in recent years. Wait times has, have soared. People who need a little extra help filling out their paperwork or who hit a problem and need someone to talk them through it. Um, have fewer and fewer people there to be able to help them out. In Massachusetts, we've seen offices close in Chelsea, which is a city of immigrants right outside Boston. We've seen them close in Greenfield, a rural community over the border from the ranking members, home state of Vermont. Without enough funding, it becomes harder and harder for the Social Security Administration to make sure that seniors and people with disabilities receive the Social Security benefits that they are legally entitled to. You know, this country made a promise to every hardworking American. Social Security will be there when you need it. America must honor its promise, and that means no cuts to the Social Security budget. Can I have an amen on that? Yeah. So we held this press conference today because we've got a budget deadline looming. But our vision is bigger than just what we're talking about today. We must look beyond the bare minimum. We've got to stop lurching from crisis to crisis and trying to desperately keep the lights on. This is the moment to focus on our core values and to carefully choose where we want to make our investments. I believe we should invest in serving our seniors. Yes, I believe that we should invest in serving Americans with disabilities. I believe that we should invest in children who have lost their parents due to the opioid crisis and who are relying on Social Security to save their benefits and get them through school. To the advocates who are here today, I just want to say one more thing. 
about why your voices matter so much in these fights. You know, a few years ago, the whole conversation in Congress was about whether to cut Social Security a little bit or whether to cut Social Security a lot. Do you remember that? That's all people talked about, right? That, that was kind of the range of the conversation. But then something happened. We started to speak out. People across the country started to speak out. Advocates raised this issue. And they said, we're not here to cut Social Security. We're here to expand Social Security. That's why we're here. And here's the deal. The whole conversation has now changed. So that one position is, well, let's just deal with Social Security a little bit. And the other is, how could we expand it even more? You know, the ground has shifted, and now nearly every Democrat in the United States Senate has voted in favor of expanding Social Security for our seniors. They have gone on the record to say, we will not let Social Security be dismantled inch by inch. And that is powerfully important. We are there. So when Paul Ryan starts to talk about ways to cut hard-earned Social Security benefits in order to pay for tax giveaways to giant corporations. Know this, we will fight back every step of the way. That is why we are here. I want to underline this one more time. Social Security is not welfare. Social Security is not a gift. Social Security is a contract that we make with each other. People have paid into Social Security and they have paid into Social Security on the understanding that the government would be a good steward of their money and that they would have protection when they need it. That's how Social Security works. And that is what we are here not just to defend but to insist that our government be a good steward for Social Security. And that starts with what we're here for today. The government cannot be a good steward of Social Security if it does not have the money to run Social Security offices. We are here to say the Social Security Administration needs adequate support in this budget. And over the long arc, count on us we are here to say the Social Security program must be protected, must be strengthened, and must serve those who need it most. That's why we're here. So thank you all for being here today. Thank you. Thank you, dear. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have to run back to a hearing. Of course. Good. Thank, thank you thank so much. Another you round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. A true champion. Our next speaker, Max Richmond. He's president and CEO of the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare. He has spent his career fighting for seniors, including here in the Senate, where he was the staff director for the Special Committee on Aging, and he continues to fight for all of us. Max. Good morning, everybody. For more than 82 years, Social Security has protected uh, Social Security beneficiaries, American workers, and it's done that by doing just what Senator Warren pointed out, serving as a lifeline to beneficiaries and their, uh, and their families. But what good is a lifeline if there's no one there to throw you the rope? Right? And we're finding more and more Americans, beneficiaries, uh, faced with this situation. No one's there tossing them the rope. So earlier this month, I just want to give you an example. Earlier this month, there was a news report about a woman in Philadelphia diagnosed with MS. She waited 788 days for a disability hearing. Can you imagine 
waiting 788 days. Why? The Social Security program did not have sufficient uh, lawyers, judges, administrative staff to keep pace with the applications and the hearings. So she waited 788 days. And the reason they didn't have the adequate support at Social Security is Congress has for many years now failed to provide the adequate funding necessary uh, to provide these services. As other speakers have pointed out, this money is in the bank. It's not like this money has to be borrowed. It's in the bank. And the failure of Congress to release this money, and I use that, that uh, phrase, release this money, because it is in the bank, put in the bank uh, with every paycheck where withholding for FICA is made. So the money is there. There's no excuse, There's no excuse for this. Uh, we've already heard today, and if you read the papers, about all of the waiting lines, the, the uh, waiting on phone calls, uh, the reduced office hours, reduced staffing, disability backlogs that failed, as Senator Sanders pointed out, 10,000 people, uh, 10,000 applicants died waiting for a hearing or an appeal. That's just not right. So, you know, I, I do a lot of town hall meetings all over the country. And people uh, ask me, especially the members of the National Committee, why is Washington doing this? Why is Washington doing this to me? And uh, as, uh, as others have pointed out, uh, you have to wonder if this is a, a concerted effort to disillusion people about Social Security, to make them question the capabilities of the people that work for Social Security, to start believing some of those awful myths that Social Security is going broke, that it won't be there in the future. I start to believe some of these things as well. And, it's, and I don't like to attribute motives uh, to people, but I'm starting to think that there is, as Senator Sanders pointed out, motivation to convince people that Social Security is not a program that's there for them now and will not be there for them in the future. So the National Committee, on behalf of our members, and supporters is demanding that Congress release the money. And again, I use that uh, uh, phrase deliberately because the money is there. It has been set aside uh, through the Social Security program to release the money that's necessary to fully fund the Social Security program and allow people demand that uh, beneficiaries, their spouses, survivors, families, have access to retirement, disability, surviving benefits, survivor benefits that they have paid for. They paid for those throughout uh, their working lives. So I'm so glad that Nancy was able to organize this event. Uh, I, I know she's going to introduce Senator Casey, but Senator Casey, I just wanted to say thank God you're the ranking Democrat uh, on the Senate Aging Committee where I was staff director in a previous life, and we look forward to hearing from you. Max, thank you very much. And um, it's my privilege to introduce a true champion, Social Security, Medicare, who's fighting for all of us, Senator Bob Casey. Thank you, thanks so much. So am I the third senator to speak? Third. Okay, I just want to make sure where I am, where we are in the order. Well, thank you very much for <clears throat> this opportunity, because uh, this is a critically important time for our country. We're obviously debating a lot of issues that you're reading about just in the next uh, number of hours and days, but we can't lose sight of some of the debates that, um, and some of the decisions we're going to have to make that will affect people's lives directly because of how. We fund uh, government agencies, especially those agencies of government that uh, help us provide the kind of benefits that, uh, frankly, some of us have taken for granted uh, and only recently, because of the threats posed, uh, are focusing on more and more. There was very little attention paid in the last year to the, the uh, debates about the federal budget because of all of the engagement we had, all of the debates. and 
real fights about health care, about tax policy, about nominations, and so many other things. I'm hoping that this year can be a year when we can uh, focus more intensively on some of the proposed cuts to the federal budget, uh, cuts that would only be proposed by uh, extreme right-wing politicians. In the case of the Social Security Administration, it starts with one word, the word promise. Social Security is a promise that we have to keep uh, to the American people. It's also an earned benefit. Uh, so when politicians casually talk about uh, cutting Social Security or cutting uh, the Social Security Administration or not keeping up with funding, uh, they have a lot of explaining to do because it is a promise and it is an earned benefit. For some reason, uh, I don't quite know why, not sure I ever will know why, Republicans spent the last year obsessed with, uh, and I would argue it, it, it was a maniacal obsession, with uh, cutting health care basically by, by decimating Medicaid. And the other obsession uh, was giving tax cuts to uh, the super rich and big corporations. I will never understand those two basic obsessions. But unfortunately, not being satisfied with what they tried to do in 2017 and were somewhat successful, obviously, in the context of the tax cuts to the super rich and corporations, now they want to embark on a new project in 2018. That's what they call, uh, by, by reference to two words, they talk about entitlement, quote, entitlement reform. Well, um, when I hear those two words, I know what they mean. That means cutting Social Security, cutting Medicare, cutting Medicaid. Um, they may use that phrase, entitlement reform, but that's really what they mean, cutting all three. And I thought I heard a presidential candidate, can't remember his name, who made promise after promise that he would not cut Social Security, would not cut Medicare, would not cut Medicaid. And yet he and they, this administration and this Congress, have proposed over and over again uh, to cut all three in one way or the other, or to at least change uh, these programs in one way uh, or another. So that obsession continues. And of course, it has, um, it has its uh, foundation in cutting uh, government. So it should be no surprise that when a budget comes along and a, an appropriations bill comes along, that there'll be proposed cuts by Republicans across the board. So here we are with, a, with a, uh, yet, yet another attempt to cut government by cutting Social Security. I know a good bit about government programs. I was the Auditor General of Pennsylvania for eight years and the State Treasurer for two. My job was to examine government programs, make sure that they were following the law, and making determinations about whether they are efficient and effective. So I don't need a lecture from some Republican politician about how government should work. I did a lot to expose when government didn't work. And, and every government agency should be held accountable if it's not working. Uh, but this uh, arbitrary, across-the-board obsession with cutting uh, often leads to dire consequences for real people. And if you think the Social Security Administration isn't critically important to delivering Social Security benefits, then you probably haven't been paying attention. And when you, under the, the guise of, of, of cutting or some other, some other argument, uh, refuse to support increases to the Social Security Administration, you're cutting Social Security. You're harming beneficiaries and you're making this country uh, lesser, a lesser country than it should be. Uh, we're a great country. We can have the strongest military in the world, which we do, uh, the strongest economy in the world, which we have, and we can also take care of people and keep our promises. So that means taking care of folks that uh, need Medicaid, whether they're children in urban or rural areas, whether that's uh, making sure that Medicaid is there for children with disabilities or adults with disabilities, and, and making sure that Medicaid is there for uh, folks who need to get into a nursing home. 
We can do all that and still protect those programs. And we can also keep our promise, a sacred promise, on Social Security. But instead, what the majority keeps going back to is this obsession, this maniacal obsession with giving rich people more money and cutting uh, government programs. And sometimes doing it in the most pernicious way possible, cutting the funding for the offices or the agencies, thereby um, reducing the likelihood that that agency or that office can deliver the benefit, can fulfill the promise. So we're going to fight very hard. We'd rather work together. We'd rather have bipartisan agreements. But if Republicans want to fight about Social Security the entire year, we are ready for that fight. We will fight morning, noon, and night on these if they want to do that. We're hoping they don't. We're hoping they set aside that obsession, uh, even though they have uh, one party rule in Congress. We hope that they will uh, get off that obsession, work with us to make sure that Social Security is always there for the beneficiaries who earned it, instead of uh, this uh, path they've been on, which is cut, slash, uh, divide and conquer and, and uh, demonize and divide. That's pretty much what they've been up to. So I'm grateful for the work that so many organizations represented here are doing every day to support Social Security, to support programs uh, that benefit so many Americans. And I know you have been in the fight with us. You will be in the fight with us. And I'm glad and honored uh, to stand shoulder to shoulder with you. Thanks very much. Senator Casey, thank you so much. That, that brings us to the end of the formal presentation. Soon we are going to be delivering these petitions to demand that the Social Security Administration be fully funded. Uh, my first book was A History of Social Security, The Battle for Social Security, and uh, this battle is going to go on. We have to remain vigilant because there are all through the 80 almost 82 year history, there have been those who have tried to destroy Social Security. We've got to fight for it. So if I can indulge the speakers for a few minutes, if anyone has questions, anyone should feel free to jump in. And, and if not, thank you all so much for coming.